Yo, welcome to another episode of the BJJ Goons Podcast. I'm your host, Tim, the Mushmaster Spriggs. And with me as always every week is... Yo, what's up everybody? It's no new Nico, Nico Ball. Glad to be back with you for another week. What's good with you, Tim? Shit, nothing same old, same old. You know, just hustling, working out. Nothing new. Enjoying the weather. I love the shirt. I love the shirt. Oh, thank you very much. It is actually warm out. I wish you didn't keep it so cold in here because Tim's wearing this Hawaiian mm. shirt and I've got a hoodie on still, but it's beautiful out. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Spring has hopefully sprung. No more cold weather. You know, people talk about global warming being a bad thing, but honestly, if every day was like this, it's okay. Florida would be underwater, but who gives a shit about Florida at the end of the day? I live in Maryland, and I don't like the snow. I mean, there's a lot of old people in Florida that people probably give a shit about. Grandparents, loved ones. Well, they can move. That's the beautiful part. We have planes, trains, automobiles, and you can move. <laughs> You know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no compassion from the lunch master this week. All no, right. no. Or last week to think about it. No, last week there was compassion, but there was so much compassion that I was just so anti non compassion. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just was so fed up <laughs> that I, I was you, I fed up you. with the bullshit. Today, there's no compassion. It's no compassion Thursday. No, there was a couple of days that we didn't actually speak this week, and I got a little bit worried that you might have actually gone down to Florida. No, nah, Nico, I'm not stupid. I had people that care about me tell me it's not worth it to go to somebody's prison. So it's all good. Very true, very true. You know, I didn't even get any pushback from what I said yes last week either. You know, you see these guys that are so like, you know, pro law enforcement, they're with them peoples. I thought I'd get a knock on the door or a call, but I guess not. So we're all in the clear. Man, have you ever been arrested before? No. Yeah, no. me neither. I've never been arrested, not for anything, not even like that, like college drunk nights, but like someone I know recently got arrested, which is really weird. I realized that no one that I really cared about or loved so much has ever been locked up and for what I'm expecting to be a little bit of time. So that's wild. I can neither confirm nor deny that I know people have been arrested, but from what they say or did not say, it is not a good look. I just don't feel like getting told to spread my cheeks and cough. I'm just not into that. I mean, it's, I mean, that's one thing. It's like, I couldn't even imagine, like, you know, like, he can't Google anything. He doesn't know anything about his case because he's in jail, and, like, he can't Google it. His lawyer don't. I was like, wow, I couldn't imagine it. Like, you, you can't do anything. Like, you don't have access to information when you want it. You can't talk to people when you want it. It's like, I'm not built for jail. Like, I, like, I tell everybody that actually knows me, it's like, I don't know what gang I would join like I don't know what clique I would be accepted in who am I supposed to eat with like that that's not a rhetorical question so I did the DMs like with advice because you know Joe I don't do anything illegal me neither I am a straight arrow I my guess would be probably be one of the Muslims in prison I feel like that's like the the, the least bad of the options that I would have in there you know, if you're a black guy in jail, you have a lot of options. If you're a white guy, I mean, it's basically the Aryan Brotherhood or nothing, right? We should ask someone that's actually been in jail and then put it on the Patreon. Someone that has been to prison. Guys, if you're watching this and if you've been in jail or prison and you're interested in sharing your story, please contact us. Uh, you know, we're, you can find me at Tim Spriggs BJJ on Instagram or Facebook. You can email us at bjjgoons100 at gmail.com as well. Seriously, like, let's let's talk about it. And I think knowing martial arts could be very handy in prison. For sure, for sure. You got to learn how to de-escalate situations and, you know, not get shanked. I think that's really important. True, 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 true. My best friend, actually, his dad was a prison guard, and so was my uncle. They have so many crazy stories. Kids, don't go to jail. Yeah, one of my first teaching jobs was actually in a jail. Really? Yeah. Worked at uh, New Beginnings in the DMV area, the old, uh, what was it? Oak Hill, the old Oak Hill. Yeah, it was interesting. Funny story about Oak Hill Detention Center. That's where you worked, right? Yeah. My dad took me to Oak Hill Detention Center to scare me straight. Mind you, though, I was never in trouble. I'm a straight arrow. Mm -hmm. I was never in trouble growing up, but for some reason, my dad had it made up in his mind that he was going to scare me straight. And I got to tell you something, Nico. 
Jail is really fucking gay. How do you... Wait, wait. <laughs> I thought you were going to say scary. Gay? It's really gay. What do you mean gay? All right, so listen. And how did you just like go to jail? How did he just take you to jail as a child? Was it like the airport? Like when before you could go in and see the planes? It's like before you could just go in and take your children to jail? Scales, scared straight style? No, no. It wasn't like that. My dad had connections. My dad was in the military, so both my parents were. My dad was, and he was cool with all the guards. I don't know. I don't really know specifically how he was able to hook it up, but he knew people. He took me to Oak Hill Detention Center. Is that even open anymore? No. So New Beginnings was built next to Oak Hill. So actually, Oak Hill is still standing, and they took us in there one time, and it looks creepy because it's just now an mm. abandoned building that's on the same property and the amount of barbed wire mm -hmm. and it looks like a mental facility from a movie exactly like the behind the scenes footage from like the movie on today and now new beginnings is supposed to it, it is really nice it's they had like really modern classrooms they had like playstations in their dorms they had really? like dorm doors that you could get out of um one at a time so you had alarm if you had to like go to the bathroom like you could kick them open because they opened the wrong way that wasn't a good thing that was a design flaw but um so they tried to like rebuild it because like the oak hill if it was anything like when you went like i saw it when it was abandoned was not a very pleasant place it was freaky as shit it was creepy however it was really <laughs> gay my vivid memories of it are when you go in through how the security guards go there's a central hub in the middle of the living quarters and it has windows all around it and the microphone and then like little buttons and stuff. And when I first came in here, came in there, there was, there was a table full of dudes and you know, Oak Hills youth detention center, I think, right? It was at the time, young kids, but this is like the nineties where like DC was the murder capital. So I'm pretty sure Still all the murder capital. It is kind of, Carjacking. As like a DC, like not native, but it's to someone to claim DC, and it's not a good thing to claim. But like as our struggle, I'd say like yeah, they suffer a lot for the size of the city. I would say, and just the size of the city, proportionately, like it's a whole lot of crime. Yeah, and I'm sure at least half of the guys had serious offenses, like murders, and they were definitely dealing drugs. It was the '90s in DC, and. When I walked in there, it was me, my dad, and the head guard that I guess my dad was friends with. These bamas were in the middle of the day room. I, it was like a central hub, like a school dorm, and there was the cells on the outside, like it's a square. So on the perimeter of the room, there are their dorms where they stay at. And in the center, it's like the day room. These bamas were sitting there playing strip poker with each other, yo. M young men playing strip poker with each other like taking their shirts off like oh I got the card and they were playing strip poker and it was that day that I realized that prison was really gay jail's gay all that stuff and I don't want to go there there's no offense like it's okay if you're gay but it's saying like that's not my bag uh, strip poker that would be weird if you saw I'm something weirded like out. that like uh I was like yeah. 7 or 8 I wasn't even I wasn't 10 yet I know I wasn't 10 yet, so around that 7, 8, 9 range, he took me there. I'm like, why would you send me here? And then I went to one of the, one of the dorms. Of course, I, had, I wasn't, like, there by myself, but, like, I got a tour, basically, of the whole facility. And, like, I would go in there, and these dudes just doing push-ups half naked. And, like, there's pictures of women half naked on the walls. I'm like, this is a mind fuck. I'm like, what is going on? Who takes a grade schooler to scare them straight? But I guess it worked because I've never been arrested. I don't plan on getting arrested. I almost did something stupid last week, but I was talked off the ledge. <laughs> so shout out to all the people that told me not to go down there. And look out for me because who knows? Maybe right now I'd be in somebody's prison playing strip poker with other inmates. But I'm not. So that is my scared straight story, Nico. And that's why I plan on never, ever, ever, ever 
getting arrested or going to prison. <laughs> he said never, ever, ever, ever flying spirit or getting but, arrested. Tim, Tim's got... I'm doing the race. A solid I'm list running. of hard news. Hard news. No, he knows his barriers, yeah. ladies. Yes. He knows his, <laughs> his boundaries. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, that is too good. My bad. And that's so far away. All right, so um, we have before promotions. we get oh, no. on to that, what you're talking about, mm-hmm. you, I want to just, we're talking about the penal system. I want to just chop this up. You have an update on the girls in D.C. Let's move on from the bad news. Can you give me that update? Because I, I came totally unprepared. So Tim's got all this info. All right, so I saw an article today on the New York Post. I don't know if I should read it all, but the two women, young women accused of the carjacking that we talked about last week, you know, we talked about situational awareness. One of the themes was situational awareness and how it could have saved this gentleman's life. They were 13 and 15 years old. And according to this article, chances are that they won't see time past the age of 21. If you are found responsible, I guess if you're a minor, it's not if you're guilty, it's whether you're found responsible. And you're, you can't be tried an adult as a 13-year-old. The 15-year-old, they may try, but they're saying most likely with this plea deal, they're just going to be locked up until the age of 21. I'm not a legal expert. I don't know what the implica- implications are for the rest of their lives. But, you know, what do you think? I mean, they basically committed murder, a carjacking, and they're most likely getting out of prison by the age of 21. It's so ironic that we're talking about that, and I went to Oak Hill. We were just talking about Oak Hill, and they're young. What are your thoughts, Nico? I mean, I work with, like, a lot of youth in D.C., so when I heard about this situation, like a 13- and 15-year-old girl doing something like this, I think it kind of indicates a serious underlying problem, like, not just, like, socially, but, like, personally with it within their families or something's wrong with them. So, like, do I think they need to be locked up? Yes. Like, forever? Of course not, because they're young and they don't know any better. But they need to be in some kind of situation where they're going to be getting help, where whatever their problem is is going to be identified and they'll get help. Do I think the penal system is ever going to be able to provide those services? Potentially no, but that's, like, a whole another battle like you're 15 you need to be child as a child because you are still a child like you obviously did something fucked up heinous and barbaric but like i would assume that there's some kind of like drug use some something under there that 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 caused that that really needs to be addressed more than how long are these girls going to be behind bars like what services are these girls going to get i agree on the aspect that they should not be tried as an adult. I always felt that was excessive in uh, many instances. And typically, because I grew up in the DMV, when you see these stories of young people committing these crimes and having them tried as adult, most of the time, from my recollection, recollection, I could be wrong, these are young African-American or Latino kids and when I was going off the handle last week and I was pissed off about the bullshit that was going on in our community in jujitsu, one of my homegirls told me that, yo, the system is not made for you. If you get in trouble in any kind of infraction, especially if it has to deal with assault or drugs, God forbid you get accused of a heinous act like murder or carjacking, You're fucked, your family's fucked, your children are fucked, and the system isn't designed for us. And the sad part about our criminal justice system is it is high in recidivism. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, you don't actually have to be accused of committing any of these crimes. You can be accused of being present while these Mm. crimes were committed and you will still go to jail like somebody could murder somebody like get out the car and murder somebody and you get back in the car and you are getting charged as an accessory for murder and i i think like a lot of people engage in stuff like have those type of friends and they're like that's on them but just be aware that's also on you you will serve years and years in jail for that as well and you know who gets paid from that the system and i i just hope I really doubt it, just the way the system is set up, that these young women will get the rehabilitation that they need. 
Because if you're 13, 15 years old doing this type of stuff, you don't have any value of human life. Or your concept of right and wrong or your concept of the gravity of these situations is such that you have normalized it. You've normalized taking it to that extreme and it's a damn shame. And it's even worse because these kids said, I quote unquote, one of them said, I want to jack a car. Like it's a joyriding thing. Funny story about that. Well, not really funny, but ironic. When I worked in D.C. for, I, I, was, I went to Mount St. Joseph High School in Baltimore. And <laughs> part of us getting to graduate was we had to do community service a certain amount of hours. I believe it was 40. Over the summer, I used to work for, I think it's called the About Face program, for kids that were too unruly or out of control to go to regular school. So they had to get credits through this program. And had it been a kid, not any older than like 15, this is at the D.C. Army. This Bama went into like the main part of the army where they have all the events like the circus and shit. He found a go-kart and he <laughs> stole it. Like literally like, like he stole it like was joyriding it and after fact he like walked up to me and was like showed me this you know how they have those files like in the cartoons where someone's breaking out of jail? Yeah. <laughs> he had one of those giant files like yo man I do this shit all the time homie. <laughs> It's too good. We just that's went on a joy good. ride. I was that's like, typical. Yeah, that's he, typical DC shit, man. And it's like that movie New Jersey Drive, all the old head. I think I think we should do a watch along for that movie for the Patreon side note. Let's but anyway, these young people are doing this stuff and it it brings me back to martial arts because one, the situation could have been prevented. I'm not blaming the victim, but these situations can be prevented if we have situational awareness, which is a huge tenet of the martial arts preventing things, de-escalating a situation with your words or preventing situations with having the 360 always looking around you. When I'm hanging with Master Lloyd, when we're out in public, he does that whole, like, he's walking and he'll do, like, a spin, stop where he is and come. Well, he's still moving mm -hmm. the same direction, but he'll look around, yeah, you know, it's, always it's turning. It's like divine numerology. The first thing you do is the knowledge. Yes, right? that 360. The first thing you do is the knowledge. Mm -hmm. You got to look that third eye is open nico mm -hmm. the cipher uh, <laughs> but uh yeah anyways <laughs> yes and i think that rehabilitation through martial arts could help these people that are these young people that are at risk we had ryan from uh project grapple he's one of our one, a few episodes ago and he's doing great work those kids are having an ability and an opportunity to make something of themselves and get out of these situations and they're occupied by a goal. They Very have true. they have to get good grades in school. In order to get good grades, you need good grades in order to be able to compete in these sports. And it's a beautiful thing. You know, I hope I these mean. young women get the help they need, but you know, it's how it is in the city, that's how it is in America. So, you it's know, it's really hard. And like, that's why even with Favela Jiu Jitsu or Tete Day Kids Project, the thing is like Jiu Jitsu to the rescue because it really does help people. It provides like people in your life. We had like this one kid that they call one of my sons, like I have Moicano and Muleza and Muleza mm -hmm. means lazy. And he had a lot of problems. Like he would smoke weed. He was very aggressive. He would go in his house and he would fight with his sister. He was actually like hitting her and like got kicked out. Like, and they just kept coming back to the project and be like, yo, you need to kick him out. And he was like, yo, he's already being aggressive and he hates you like if we kick him out like where's he gonna go where's he gonna go he's gonna have no one and he really like he doesn't have anybody except like maybe buddha who is a guy from brazil that like um that got out of jail he like really takes care of him because he does smoke a lot of weed he's really bad at jobs like he sucks at showing up on time so he has like a lot of faults and like people think like oh i'm gonna do the social work and these kids are gonna be great they're gonna be like the tli kids we're about to talk about but like sometimes like doing the work is just like being there as somebody fucks up over and over and over again and just making sure that they know that they have somebody because at some point if that kid Muleza didn't like I, my thing with him was like always like I don't think he's smart enough to be live that street life like he's gonna get shot he's gonna get hurt if he doesn't have somebody to take care of him and like I hope he's manned up and he is smarter and I was wrong in that aspect but at the same time he's never been alone or never had to be alone damn yeah so I think that 
we need to get martial arts in schools. I think we need to reach one, teach one, and prevent this stuff from happening because whether we like it or not, the kids are watching. And if we don't give a damn about the kids, and now with schools virtually being closed, I mean, virtually they have school, but essentially they're closed. It's more important than ever to get them involved. And speaking of kids doing martial arts, I'm really pleased at... I'm going to fix it. Yeah, sure. I'm really pleased to say that we had a lot of kids that came up in the youth program for Team Lloyd Irvin get promoted. So we had, well, some of these people are adults, but we had promotions at TLI this week. We had Justin Hickey, Elijah Dorsey, Corey Dorsey, Ryan Lackey, Cedric Bryan, Enrico Staten, The Flash. They all got promoted. Dang. And what's dope about them is, like, they're always, like, do they not always get promoted together? Like, I know them as, like, a squad, as, like, a <laughs> unit. Like, the Dorsey brothers, who, by the way, rolled up on me the other day in the city. Because oh. uh, they actually, they started their own business. They got, like, a power washing company, a house washing company. So, you know, he just, like, saw me pulling up to my house, pulls over, pops out of his work truck. I was like, all right, <laughs> man, you doing your thing. Y'all got business trucks. So that's yeah. dope to see, like, you know. And I know he like because i've heard him come like come into the gym and like pitch these business ideas or like really work on it like just inside of tli and have that support which is dope shout out to them it was i'm so pleased to see them do that i mean also shout out to array and jamil and muhammad they got their stripes too but shout out to those young people despite the pandemic these guys still grinded it out a lot. They have their own businesses in some aspects. Like Rico has his own business. Elijah and Corey have their own business. Ryan Lackey, he's been doing this forever. He had to make that huge drive all the time. Justin coming back from a major neck injury. Rico, he's a hustler. Cedric, I mean Cedric Bryant, this guy, I remember he went away to college. He got his degree. He came back and he's back to teaching. And they persevered. For them to be training like they have and to get a Promotion from this team, Team Lloyd Irvin, is huge, especially considering we have a whole ass pandemic. Mm-hmm. These bamboos was in the back room at the gym training. They was in Master Lloyd's garage training this whole time and did not stop. I mean, just seeing the sacrifices these young men have made like their whole lives. These kids started when they were little, little. Like, I started when I was 16. These guys started when they were single digits, a lot of them. Highly impressed. And this sport is not easy. Jiu-jitsu is not easy at all. People take jiu-jitsu for granted. I think jiu-jitsu in a lot of ways is the redheaded stepchild of combat sports. When we talk about the boxing and the kickboxing and the MMA. I mean, it's new. It's fresh. It's the baby. So it gets mistreated a lot. It does get... Wait, babies don't get mistreated. What are you talking about? I mean, by the older brothers and sisters, yeah. By the parents that my kid loved. Oh, true. I'm an only child, folks, so I don't really know the dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, what was I was gonna say, jujitsu is hard. It is hard to get a belt in jujitsu, from my experience, and for them to get a belt despite all the circumstances, they didn't make any excuses. They got the job done. They did the damn thing. They really did. They really did. They really been trying to find a way to make it work, and not only just to train jujitsu, but they really like band together. Like when Sadiq has a fight, or one of the MMI guys has a fight, um, they also have to switch over to nogi, and they really get in on those fight camps and really support each other as they're training for each competition or each goal that they have, which is really dope. You don't always see that in a lot of teams. Like you see, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you definitely don't see. It. I like. Preach. Tell them. Tell the people. I've been. It's just been in a lot of places where it's very clicky. Like you can go to a team, and it's like I've gone to worlds. Like I've gone to worlds, Europeans, and every major competition, and not really had the support from my team. People be like, "Oh, when are you competing again?" And we're like, "Yo, you were part of my world's camp, son. Like, stop talking to me in between rounds and let's go." Like, um, but they just have no idea, and like they could support you as a person, but if they really are not invested in your dream, it just makes it a little bit harder. And I guess that's the difference between being on a competition team, um, because because maybe that was my problem was these other places weren't really competition oriented but mm-hmm. you know i really like the support that i get from them like i i haven't been in the gym or training with the team for like a full year but i still talk to master lloyd like i'll send him little clips every now and then and you know i don't feel that far away from them i think the shared suffering of a training camp or a tough gym 
can bring a lot of camaraderie. Tough times bring people together. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, it's, we got a brother in Abu Dhabi we'll talk about a little bit later. But yeah, like the, the training camps and the bonds that you have. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the great part about the gym that I come from is that there's a hierarchy as far as jujitsu goes, as far as the belts, but socially there is no hierarchy. It's like, man, we all just come here. We're all dogs in here. And the way we train, we're going to get at each other, and there's no freaking ego. And we're all hungry, and I think it's rare. We want the homies to win just as badly as we want to win. And it's not for, like, a team accomplishment type of thing. It's just that we care. Yo, I th- I, I, I got to... <laughs> I got to negate that statement and say that there can be a lot of ego but they'll nip that shit in the butt like i remember i forget who it was it might have been like just, somebody said something like i'm gonna fuck you up with like a blast double like under their breath and master lloyd stopped the whole training he's like go ahead try to fuck the wrestling coach up Let's, <laughs> like so <laughs> This is a funny moment to me, but it's like a lot of people let that shit go and like they have that passive aggressive stuff and it's like nah you nip that shit in the butt like right away it's like We do we do keep it one hundred. <laughs> I like, think some of the group chats that we have we definitely keep it we just keep it one hundred with each other. I think the whole no bitch assness, no excuses type thing goes a long way because we talk shit to each other. Some of us do. Like, me and DJ will talk shit to each other, and we get sensitive and butthurt. But, like, at the end of the day, we're just like, yeah, but we want to fucking win. Like, yeah, well, you're pissing me off. But, like, especially our team, it's like us against them, kind of. Like, we're like, yeah, yeah, you know, you get on my fucking nerves. But we got to take on all these other teams that fucking hate us, and the media don't give us no love. Like, fuck them. We hate, uh, we hate y'all more than we hate each other. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, you might talk shit, and you might make me mad, but... Yo, like, I'm, it's us against them. Don't get it wrong. Like, they don't fuck with us. And I think that's great for the gym. And we nip that shit in the bud. <laughs> I think that's great for the gym atmosphere. I think it is great for the atmosphere. And <laughs> it's we, true. And, it motivates you, you know? Like. And, you know, some gyms, like, it's crazy. Hey, we had this thing where it's like, yeah, you know, we're, we're welcome to visitors. But don't come up in here thinking we're, this is easy work. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so tight-knit that there's, like, an unspoken rule. You, if you bring a visitor in here, you better not get fucking washed because we train hard all the time. DJ has this thing where he says, he says, he'll get mad. He's like, yo, listen, man, I don't mind if you lose, but you better fuck these, try to fuck these guys up. Like, disrespect them like you disrespect me. Put them on the mixtape. All that stuff you do to me, and it's not just DJ saying, but all of us say is like, yo, listen, you in the room fucking me up, you better fuck this guy up. I don't give a damn what happens. You better wash him like you wa- we wash each other in here. And that's, I think that's great. That's, that's the energy that you need in a gym. And shout out to all our coaches, too, because they set the tone. No easy rounds, no easy practices, no easy belts. We're on the subject of promotions. I know of people that have left academies because they felt as though they weren't getting promoted quick enough. I hear stuff like that all of the oh. time. Like It's just a headache of, oh, when am I going to get this? Or that person got their belt, but I didn't. Or like <sighs> I need to compete more to get a belt. But who am I to speak? I don't even know how many years I've been a blue belt for. But you train, though, Nico. Yes, which, which means, yeah. You know. I do know, yeah. You understand. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a unique and interesting situation, as it is. Yeah. For myself. I'm, I'm, I, my plan is actually to trade 938 pieces of women's apparel for my damn purple belt within the next two months. All right, so what are your thoughts on, like, people doing that leaving because they're not getting promoted enough or fast enough what are your thoughts um i think that's stupid um but it all depends on your perspective like to me like i've never put that much value on a belt i put value on being better than people and being able to be people um so what is the belt like i put value on having like a good teacher that knows my style like for example like i could have probably gotten my purple belt when i trained at beta academy because i went to worlds after worlds there's always a belt test 
I was at the level at Beta where they, they could have just been like, give it to her because I had also been there for long enough. But at the same time, and I always tell people this, I had to tell the person that I didn't want a belt from them because I wanted it from today, from my brother. And then when, and that was very hard for me. It's not like, oh, I was going to, that was very hard for me to like come out and tell somebody this. But it was also very hard because I don't have a relationship with that person. Um, and I don't speak to him like that. Um, and in the end, I would tell people, I was like, if he could tell you any past that I do, I would accept a belt from him, but he can't. And that's why I don't want a belt from him, because he hasn't instilled in me his jujitsu. Like, Master Lloyd could give me a belt, and I'm sitting here saying I want it from today, and I'd be like, okay, because Master Lloyd knows me, and he has instilled in me, like, he has made me better, you know, and, and I am his student. Um, and that's what I look for, not just be like, oh, I've been, I'm literally a blue belt for like seven years now, like, because I can't catch up with Tay today, <laughs> like, mm. but it is what it is, like, people, random refs that I don't know from Brazil, they'll be like, are you, are you still a blue belt? Like, what's up with that? And I'm mm. like, Tay today, and I'm like, oh, but it is what it is. Have you ever gotten the classic, oh, you're a blue belt? My nephew is a black belt in karate. I yeah, kind of, or like they'll bring up other martial arts. I feel like anytime, uh, it might be locked like up, uh, computer problems. Anytime that you bring up martial arts or that you're a fighter, like people try to like give you all these other stories or they want to see something. So I actually try to not tell anybody that I'm a fighter, but other people always introduce, oh, she's a fighter, and, da, 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 and I hate that. I've been in situations where people ask me if I do martial arts, and I just do this deep internal sigh like ah, i do jujitsu because i don't want to have to get in this long conversation with people that don't know about mixed martial arts or don't know about martial arts that much and they just tell me these stories about you know hey man i saw blood spurt that guy frank dukes he was a killer or I say I do jujitsu, and it's like, oh yeah, I did jujitsu in the army, and they start doing like these weird katas, or like, let me show you this wrist lock that I know, and I'm like, dude, mm. no. See, it's like, and I know the katas and too, and everything. It's like I still, I don't know. I still, I I love the katas. I think katas have a place in martial arts. However, it's not my bag. Like <laughs> I, I, I'm not trying to be in this long drawn out conversation about how you did judo third. 30 years ago, guy. Like, I get it. Like, you did it, but that's not really my thing. I don't want to have to explain or just have to sit through your ex explanation of how you used to do something, and then you really didn't do what I do. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> like, they, I feel like that's just, like, the natural part of doing martial arts, and especially when you're, like, a teacher, because... I don't know. I've heard people come into gyms for like trial ca classes and just lay out their whole life story, and it's just like a lot. It's a lot. It's 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 a heavy burden to to carry. Some people just want somebody to talk to. I'm okay with talking about it, but I just don't like the whole like they do like karate hand chops and stuff. Like I used to do this, this, and this, and they it, sometimes people come off as very condescending in that when they talk about that shit. Like when I was a lower belt. I remember I wanted to be an instructor, like have like a jujitsu club at the gym at the school and college. And they're like, oh, you're a blue belt? You're not a black belt? I'm like, do you know how hard it is to get ranked in Brazilian jujitsu? No, nobody does, Tim, and you just kind of have to accept that. Everybody. <laughs> no. I'm a curmudgeon. Don't shame me for being a curmudgeon, okay? A what? Curmudgeon. Curmudgeon. Just somebody that is just very sour about certain things. Okay, that's Can you give me three reasons why I shouldn't shame you for using that word? <laughs> I can't give you three reasons. I'm <laughs> sorry. Curmudgeon? Shame when me. Did you okay. Look? How do you spell that? I think you're making. Are you making up words? You have an iPhone, Miss iPhone. You can a ask Siri. Siri, is curmudgeon a real word? All right, Tim is safe because Siri don't it, want to act right. Siri's on his side. Probably because he's been walking around here with no shirt on. It's all on Siri's like, he's got the abs. But whatever. <laughs> Tim is a curmudgeon. What is a curmudgeon? A curmudgeon. Let me give you the definition. Let's see if my phone. What is a curmudgeon? Here's the definition of curmudgeon. A bad tempered person, especially an old one. Ah, a bad tempered person, especially an old one. <laughs> Where did you learn this word, Tim? Okay. I was a sociology major in college, so I had to think of a lot of words. That's why I'm really good at videos, because I'm very good at spewing out words that make me sound smart when I'm actually bullshitting. 
<laughs> okay, curmudgeon. That's the secret sauce. Uh... <laughs> All right, so I don't think people will ever get the point that, you know, there are less belts in jiu-jitsu as well than karate. So karate doubles mm-hmm. the belt. So, And the katas, like with karate, it's always very exact what you have to do like i was telling you when i did my keto and the belt test it's like even though it was a mix of like karate and like fighting it's like i know i have to learn this form these fighting combos this weapon and i'm gonna have to fight this amount of people and that i'll also need like an okay you're right like i need to learn all these things and then once i know i can be like yo it's time for my belt like i mm-hmm. can start bugging a person like it's not like jujitsu where you're gonna be like oh i've been a purple belt for a year and i went to a world it's like now i can have the audacity to be like it's time like you should never ask for a belt in jujitsu it's a little bit different than karate and never. i think nobody will ever understand that so i don't think that's a battle that we should choose to fight like let's work on the olympics not what people think it is compared to karate because <laughs> that's a headache that know? is a, it's a headache and it's not to me to sound like i'm cocky or be or curmudgeon but it's like oh, i gotta explain to this person what jujitsu is i gotta tell them the whole history and they're just gonna shake and nod their head like they know what i'm talking about they're not and it just wasted both of our times anyway let's go into the philosophy of promoting you mentioned earlier there's like criteria in traditional martial arts mm-hmm. When I did traditional martial arts, there were katas for each belt that you had to know. There were techniques that you had to know. And I think there's a place for that. I love that idea. As someone that went to college and they had, you know, the 101, the 1000C, 2000C, 3000C level of courses, all the way from your bachelor's to your master's to your doctorate and what have you, since martial arts is an art and it's a study of, you're studying it, you're a student, I think part of our grading and our promotion should involve that. But through my experience with a sport like jiu-jitsu and martial arts, combat sport, there's kind of two lanes. There's the serious competitor lane, and then there's the hobbyist lane. Mm -hmm. And then between that, there's children and adults. And promotions, in my opinion and through my experience, should be adjusted for whatever lane you're going into. Like for kids, I think it should be very academic in their promotion system. There should be a set amount of techniques that you need to know for each belt. There's some movements that you need to know for each stripe that you get. Because when I was the head instructor, and even afterwards when I was teaching or helping to teach there, each belt, each stripe, each month had a curriculum. And you needed to pass it in order to get upgraded. And I love that idea. This is no different than school. You have to have the basics down. If you don't know this shit, the building blocks to your foundation are not going to be good. And if you don't have a good foundation, you're not doing the art right. You're going <laughs> to get <good>. hurt. <laughs> you know? Thoughts on that? I mean... I agree with you completely, but I think the hard part is who sets the foundation? How do you know what the basics are? And that's kind of what I see people struggling like to kind of align. Like, what should you know at each belt? And depending on the team, it's like, I know Gracie Baja is very specific. They have that curriculum down, and they literally give their students, like, month cards, and you check it off, and you can check your way to your belt by the amount of times you're in class. Even right? adult? Yes. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, at least, in, and I'm talking about Brazil, okay. um, which is where Gracie Baja comes from. So, like, that's yeah, where they got all of the things. So they have their like, they also have a list of about 50 rules that you need to follow. One of which uh, is writing your name on your key, and so like, they're very strict in what they do. I know Alliance has like a guidebook that's like also also just like a, a normal teacher's manual, and it goes through each belt, what you need to learn, and then it will have each position, and it will be like armbar, and it will be like three pages of how an instructor is supposed to teach an armbar. But then you have like Fernando Tedede, who's a five-time world champion, and I have been in his gym when he first opened it, trying to have one of his first belt tests, sitting there with the secretary that doesn't do jujitsu and a brown belt, and they're like, I don't know, what, what do I make them have a test? Do I just give them their belts? Do like and like, at what point do you decide what is your way? Like I don't know. It's hard. Mm. It's more of an art than a science in promoting. <laughs> I will give you that. <laughs> I will give you that. 
<laughs> it is more of an art than a science. Now, with the other, with adults, I think we can do that, be a little bit more flexible. Because, I'm going to be honest with you, you just checking off the card on your little sheet, and you just putting the time in, just like going through the motions, I'm not a big fan of that. Because that's not really a good gauge of how well you're doing. From my experience, when we train, you can be a hobbyist or a black belt world champion. We train together. We learn the same shit. Now, the level of intensity and the training program, I mean, the training schedule is going to be different. If you're a black belt world champion, you're doing two to three training sessions a day. You're doing strength conditioning. You're watching film, what have you. If you're a hobbyist, you're going to one class a day, a few times a week. And although you are a hobbyist, you will be training with these people your path to that next rank and ultimately the black belt is going to take you a little bit longer just from the strength of you're not getting to those glorious hypothetical 10,000 hours that you need to be a master of something as quickly as someone that is training like a professional athlete trying to become a black belt world champion. When I'm thinking about promoting someone, if they're an adult, I have to take into account their knowledge which I think the academic approach would be helpful because it needs to be written down. Oh, you talking about academic, academic, like a written test? No. Written down is in like the techniques, the fundamental, no, no, hell no, 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 not that, no. Because at the end of the day, this is an ass-kicking contest. Fuck the writing. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, like, I'm trying to write down, the techniques have to be, have to be known. What are the fundamentals? Armbar. Triangle, Uma Plata, like have th- know those techniques. Now there are big dudes that only do a handful of techniques and they're successful at them, and they don't know a whole bunch of jujitsu. I don't think that's a very positive thing. If you're a competitor, I can see you getting pushed through the ranks. If you're trying to be a competitor, if you are a hobbyist and you only do these same techniques and you're kind of successful at them or very successful, I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt so much because I want knowledge. You know what I mean? It's okay in application not doing a whole bunch of moves, but you need to know enough to be a black belt. Like, to me, my standards of a black belt is someone that, I mean, look at me. I don't know. I don't remember all the techniques or all the basics, but I know the fundamentals enough that I can teach a basics class. I can piece together the building blocks. If you gave me a day, I could write a curriculum from basic to advanced. You should be able to know that stuff. You shouldn't be a black belt doing like, hey, man, all I know is this Osoto to me being a fat lard laying on top of you and comoring you. Now, you might win a whole bunch of tournaments and you will get promoted, but I'm not looking at you as a high level black belt in that sense. I feel you. I feel you. So but when, do you see a lot of people that get to a black belt and are at that level of inadequacy? As far as what? A world champion level? A elite competitor level? I think that I see it both ways. I know I personally don't do a lot of my matches. I have a very... Oh, let me take that back. I know a lot. I can do a lot of shit, but a lot of my matches move in the same straight line. All jiu-jitsu is a straight line, essentially. From You start in the standing, you hit the ground, you get to the submission. But my straight line is very simple. However, and but I still know a lot of jiu-jitsu. I think if you get to the black belt elite level, you're going to know enough jiu-jitsu. Now, if you're able to apply it in a teaching setting, it's not going to be as much. However, there's a lot of guys that are black belts that don't know much jiu-jitsu. That just get by. And that's what I don't like. That's why I'm kind of a proponent of some form of testing or some form of you having to teach or demonstrate that you can teach in order to get your black belt. Because we only compete for a fraction of our careers as martial artists. The rest of the time, you're going to be a teacher or you're going to be learning or going to have to pass on knowledge. And, you know, when you go, I don't really know of a good way of... (laughs) Now that I think about it, I don't know if there is a good way of doing it. Yeah, you're kind of giving me a headache. Because um, I'm like, as you're talking, I'm like, you know, but that's just like, 
swimming in an ocean of like, but how are you going to hold people accountable? And it's like, you know, you got to think of like, if you're an, a mediocre black belt and you have a school, like how are you going to bring people up to be like the details that you're losing along the way to transmitting to your students? And it's just kind of like a headache. And like, when you think of jujitsu as being such like a new sport and us just not being unified or having a unified rule set, let alone mm, a unified like that's a way to promote like... That's a lot. That's just a lot. That is a lot. That's that's why I said it's more art than science. Uh, I think having a written down curriculum or a Bible of jujitsu of some sort for not just all the jujitsu, like IBJJF having official, like these are all the techniques, but for your academy or you as an instructor, if you want to open a gym, I think it's a good idea to have your own towel, like how Bruce Lee had the towel of Jeet Kune Do. I have this thing that I've been working on off and on where it's like the Tao of Jiu-Jitsu where mm. I break it down to basic fundamental movements that you need for grappling, like a forward roll, a backward roll, a Granby, a cartwheel. I mean, if you're like a super athlete, a back flip or a front flip or whatever, but from those to what grips there are, cross collar grip, cross sleeve grip, pants grip, the grips, then it's positions. Masterlet has a top or bottom parallel perpendicular thing, but I go into a lot more detail on what I am trying to do. And it keeps me in my mind refreshed in the art because if you don't exercise that muscle of teaching, of going back to the fundamentals, going back to exploring different guards, you're going to lose it. And then you might end up being one dimensional and it's going to make it difficult for you to teach and help your students be better than you because at the end of the day that's what it's all about very true very true learning the fundamentals is essential i know like because i've drilled like even like because master Lee made me drill like one thing for so long and it just seemed like okay but what about everything else and mm -hmm. then like at the end of the year the whole year of drilling this one thing i came like and when i finally went into the competition and that I realized that it had expanded into so many other like the philosophy of that that position which is basically the grip that I needed the control of the hips not letting them move their hips until I was ready to to transition and that transition was either going to be into a submission or me taking your back and like it just work it works in so many places and like different passes and like I didn't realize it for a year. I was like, I'd get kind of pissed because, and like, anytime Master Lord wasn't there, like, Mom, can you have to drill? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Until Master Lord show up. But like, I am so good at it. But, and like, what's forced me to be good at is I get so bored that I'd have to just, like, microanalyze all these little aspects of it. Like, until I became, like, like the, the idea of, like, keeping the hips pinned to the ground so they can't turtle. Like, you know, I've just done it for hours and hours. Like, you know, and it translates to so many other things. And I didn't realize that in the process. I just had to do what he said, which was really boring while I was doing it. But now I have such a better understanding of the mechanics of the movement that I can apply to other things. I think that's the beautiful part about it. If you learn one system enough, you learned how to learn at a high level. You understand the mechanics at a high level, and you can pass it on to whatever you do. Like that's a that's that's what makes him Master Lewis is a great teacher. Mm -hmm. But I have to say I'd have to have like a lot of trust because the whole time it's like I'll be going to Worlds and I like my takedown was messed up. Like I I had a problem with my takedowns that wasn't solved, and I was really scared. And I was like I need to be like wrestling and and like his answer would be that like if you were a blue belt that just started i would pull you from competition and you wouldn't compete because you're not ready so like do, like you work on your past and like don't worry about what you feel like you need to to work on to go to worlds this year because like the goal maybe shouldn't be this year the goal should be being world champion next year when like I had everything so and like that was kind of hard because I would really want to be like I need wrestling I need wrestling but that wasn't what I needed and I had to have that trust to get through that point and I think ultimately the key to promotions is patience patience and trust so Nico we got some people traveling this week Yes, yes. Like Abu Dhabi, and this kind of snuck up on me. Abu Dhabi, Grand, no, it's even not Grand Slam. It's the world. It is yeah. the big dog out there. Big I money. <laughs> we got the homie Kieran, uh, TLI Brownbow. Yara. 
Yara's out there. I saw Yaz. Nobody knows who Yaz is, but she is a um, black girl from Portugal. Amazing. She's an Angolan athlete, killing it out there. There's not that many women in this sport. That's not that many women of color in the sport. They never get any recognition. This woman should be getting more. She became a two-time world champion out there. So shout out to Yaz. And the Gmart people, the Gmart homies are there too. I think Simba's competing in it out there. Simba, he was our guest. Yeah. Go birds. I mean, this this is a big tournament. I remember going to Abu Dhabi a few times in the lower belts. I think I went as a black belt too. I Did don't you remember. get flown out? Do they always pay for tickets? Oh, I got flewed out, baby. Oof. I got flewed. So out. what do you have to do to get flewed out to Abu Dhabi? Just win a Grand Slam. For when, those that don't know. When I was doing it, you had to win the trials. And those trials were heated. And the East Coast trial, that shit was rough. I had to go against all those Marcelo Garcia guys. Every dude on the East Coast and some guys from the West Coast, too, would do these trials because you got money for winning the trials. And then if you won, oh, Lordy, if you won, you got paid. Like, Bamos is getting like 5K at Purple Belt for winning their weight class yeah that is what's up that's the thing about abu dhabi you know like they have all these sheiks behind them they have a lot of money and they're trying to like actually put back into the athletes which is awesome yeah i mean i wish they did that over here i mean there's a there's tournaments here there's super fights here they're the ogs that put money in the sport i still have the dvd from the first one they did when tarsus had a beard and he was the best grappler in the world for like that one year like they've been doing it for a long time if I wasn't retired, I'd think about putting my hat in that ring and getting paid like that. But, you know, shout out to everybody going over there. And that trip is a beast. That trip is rough. How long is it? Yeah, you don't even think about it. That's all the way on the other side of the world. That The flight is about a dozen hours, Nico. On one plane, no layover. So, like, it, if, you get, if you get Etihad Airways, yeah, you get... You get the straight flight there, and it's nice. It's a nice airline, but I'm kind of tall, and my back isn't the best. So when I'm sitting in that seat, it, it's rough. I will suggest this. If you're on a flight that long for a competition, there's some things you should get. You need to get emergency That's um, vitamin C. Vitamin C, yeah, not emergency. Emergent. Emergent. C. <laughs> C. Emergent C. And you need to get melatonin. To help you sleep. Yes. You need to stay hydrated. Because if you're in that flight and you're in that plane, you're going to get dehydrated. I mean, if you're cutting weight, I get it. But if it's a 12-hour flight like that, man, like, you don't really need to worry too much about it, about the water thing. Because you're going to need that water and it's going to help you keep from getting sick. If you're on a flight that long to compete, try to sleep on the schedule of the time that you will be at for that week of competition or however long. Even for Europeans, I try to get on a European time sleep schedule like on that flight. So if it was 12 p.m. my time local, but it was nighttime wherever I'm going to land, I'm trying to, as soon as I get on that flight, go to sleep. So then if I land during daytime... I'm awake like I was a local for wherever I landed. Yeah, that is That kind of stuff. But, yeah, staying hydrated and getting your vitamins in is going to go a long way to keeping you from getting sick. Also, when you go to long trips for these tournaments, I highly suggest that you find out where you're going to be able to work out and the nearest sauna if you're a weight cutter, if you need to cut weight for your division. Those are just the basics that I would say for all the people that have to travel far for tourneys. Oh, my bad. Hitting the mic. Sorry, if you're watching the video, new computer, new problems. New computer, new problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would definitely say drinking water is a really important one. Like, the lack of water is what hydrates, dehydrate, or sorry, what gives you jet lag. So, people have also told me to, like, be careful when I'm eating on the plane. Like, mm -hmm. not to eat at random times. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, be prepared to fight when you get there like i flew out to vegas and i didn't realize this for masters worlds i flew out maybe two days before i fought and then i was on weight but it was like the night before and i thought i was gonna be able to relax and 
I didn't have to cut weight over there, but Muhammad sent me a message. He was like, yo, you're in the desert. Like, you need to work out because it's completely different. Like, and he actually made me get up at, like, 10 o'clock at night and go run. Like, and it was a good thing that I did because, like, afterwards, like, I was coughing a lot. Like, my lungs were really feel, filled, but, like, that didn't occur to me. He was like, you can't just go all the way out to Vegas and not do anything before you have to fight. Like, you have mm-hmm. to exercise somehow before, like, your competition. And, unfortunately, it was the next day, so I was just like, oh, shit. Like, and I didn't think of that. Mm-hmm. Depending on how long I'm there for, I'm going to get a few workouts in. So, if it's a world's trip and we got a whole week there... I'm kind of training, I'm not training hard, but I'm training at the same schedule I typically would. The day before, I don't really do anything. I relax. I might get a light run in. If I'm competing at night, like say for a super fight, that morning, I'm going to get a good workout in. Nothing too strenuous, but a nice run or a hundred burpees, something to get the muscles moving, take a nice shower and eat. Oh yeah, another thing. Food. If you are a dope ass, broke ass grappler, find the nearest grocery store and cook your food because food. on these trips, you do not want to spend a bunch of money on food. Now, if you're getting flued out and you got a sugar daddy like a lot of these pros do, or you got somebody paying your way or whatever, by all means, do it. But I try to keep it as natural and as simple as it is when I'm home. Very true. No crazy Stick ass food. Stuff. Like you're not on vacation. This is a business trip. It is. You know what I'm saying? So. Save the In and Out Burger for after you compete, <laughs> animal style. Oh, yeah. Very true. Very true. It, it's very hard to have that kind of discipline. Although I will say that that discipline, like the food in Japan, saved me because I had to compete two days in a row. I was barely on weight, and then. I don't speak Japanese, so it's very hard to order food, and then they don't eat a lot. So all I had for food was, like, raw fish or just kind of, like, fish. There was, like, no rice, no anything. Had I been in America or Europe or anywhere else, like, the food that they eat would have, like, made me go up in weight. But I was just eating so clean. I was like, thank God for <laughs> thank God for Japan, man. Thank God for Japan. I still got to go. Oh, Japan is amazing. Definitely. I definitely want to go. But, yeah, that's my advice for people that are traveling out for long tournaments. Shout out to everybody going to Abu Dhabi, you know. Shout out to them. Good luck. Happy hunting. Nico, anything you want to add this week? Um, No. Real quick question, a little discussion. We got some extra Patreon content that I have. Me and Tim have been so busy, we haven't discussed when we're going to drop it. So, Tim, when we drop in, we got a technique for you. We got some yoga stuff, and we're about to, like, hash it out. When, when, when will you see it on Patreon? The 15th. The 15th. Yes, we always drop Patreons on the 1st and 15th, on the 1st of the month, and the but 15th. But no, then they're going to get, wait, it's. The 15th is Monday, but then you're going to get an extra episode and an extra video. Yes. Yeah. So you're getting two a Q&A. on the 15th. Yeah, so all the homies on the Certified Goons tier, you guys are going to get a special Q&A answer from yours truly. Shout out to the homie Mark Banks for hooking us up. You know, these tiers give you special, not abilities, perks for each tier and you know every month we give you guys perks for each so if you're a little homie you're gonna get a perk every month if you're a big homie you get perks every month and of course if you're a certified goon you get perks so we spread it out between the first and the 15th you know depending on which tier you are you will get something special for that tier so if you have special gifts that you get during the month you're gonna get it at least once that month so Make sure if you're interested in getting all this great BJJ Goons content, whether it's techniques, whether we answer your questions, whether it's a watch along, a live Q&A, if it's unruly, uncensored content about what we do, like like the uncensored episodes or the ones that we get down and dirty, go to (laughs) patreon.com slash BJJ Goons. But yeah, I love giving you guys these techniques. You're going to enjoy the ones, the answer that I give this week on the uh BJ Jacobs Patreon for all the certified goon tier people. Anything else, Nico? No, that's it. Make sure you follow me at No New Nico. If you're new to the podcast, make sure to slide over there. And all of our merch, which we should have some new BJJ goon shit coming out, mm-hmm. is on favelajujitsu.com. You can find me at Tim Spriggs BJJ at Instagram and Facebook. And if you have a question for the podcast, like fan question, even if you're not a patron, you can email us at 
bjjgoons100 at gmail.com. This has been the BJJ Goons Podcast. Peace. Peace.